Many secularists also say and probably believe that if you say the true story about the history of conflict, this will create revenge. Then there are also more radical secularists, more radical, well, Islamists, as they say, who just hate Hinduism. And so when they hear, you know, oh, yeah, among Hindus there is this plan about rewriting the textbooks, they are at any rate against it. So they are at any rate against the correction of history because it's a Hindu project, though it ought to be simply a historian's project. This is not for Hindu Rashtra or, you know, Hindu, any Hindu demand. No, you see, this is what historians should want. Any historian should want the true history to be told. Then um, there are also nowadays the so-called social justice warriors who have something in favor of minorities. They're always against the majority. And... In India, the majority happens to be Hindu, at least depending on how you define Hindu. And so the good guys here are the minorities, and the Hindus are the bad guys. And so you should not give them any victimhood. Now, let's go to India, finally. What happened there? So there was a mass slaughter of Hindus, many times over, starting with the um, initial uh, Muslim invasion in 633. Well, in keeping with the latest developments in history, I will say it was an Arab invasion. You see, there's a new school of historians that claims that the Arabs were not Muslims yet. You see that uh, this was, uh, that they belonged to a particular sect of Christianity, or at least their ruling class embraced uh, anti-Trinitarian Christianity. Those Christians who do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, we believe that Jesus was special and that he's coming back at the end of time and so on, but he was not the son of God. Now, that's exactly what Islam says. Jesus is very present in Islam, but not with the same status that he has in official uh, Christianity. Anyway, so the Arabs invaded and uh, they were repelled. They were thrown back. And so after several more attempts, the first successful invasion was in 712 of Sindh, you know, which on the scale of India is only a peripheral territory in the West. And then more and more came. Uh, Mahmoud Ghaznavi is one of the worst around the year 1000. Mohammed Ghori is the one who really broke into India. You know, he or his lieutenants conquered the whole Ganga plain. Mali Kafur was one of the first native converts who uh, essentially behaved the same. Sikander Buchikan is mostly, well, famous for his name. Buchikan means idol destroyer. So Bud comes from Buddha, it means a Buddha statue. And so uh, the, the Buddhas of Bamiyan in Afghanistan were too big for the technology back then to destroy. That had to wait till more recently. But in general, they destroyed Buddha statues and Shiva statues and uh, Krishna statues and all the rest. And their worshippers too. Then you have Timur, who mostly fought against other Muslims, but nevertheless, when he occupied Delhi, he uh, singled out the Hindus for killing. Then uh, Babar, the founder of the Mughal dynasty, Aurangzeb, the most famous or the most notorious Mughal, Tipu Sultan, and others. Uh, till, till quite recently, namely you have a million fold slaughter during the partition in places like Lahore, in, in West Pakistan at that time, because East Bengal was then East Pakistan. Then when that part became Bangladesh, 
there was again a slaughter by the Pakistanis and by their allies, the Jamaat-e-Islami, killing, according to the Bangladeshi government, some 3 million people, of whom uh, about 80% were Hindus. Then uh, the, um, an another occasion where the word genocide is being used now, like, like the last weeks, is the case of the expulsion of the Pandits from Kashmir. You see, a movie was made about it, The Kashmir Files. In the movie itself, it is being discussed whether this should be called genocide. So I noticed that all the people associated with the movie the last few weeks speak you know, normally about genocide. Now, I am among those who fuss about this word. You see, this is not a genocide. The technique of the Islamic terrorists was kill one to expel a hundred. And those are about the exact proportion of indeed those killed versus those who fled. So at any rate, the result was perhaps the same as expulsion, namely that the pandits are gone from Kashmir. There, there aren't any. So, um, and even now with the normalization or you know, the abolition of the special status of Kashmir, they have not really been restored there, rehabilitated there. Famously, Professor K. S. Lal in 1979 uh, wrote a book wherein he developed an estimate of 80 to 100 million Hindus missing from the demographic figures between 1000 and 1525. 1525 is the end of a system called the Delhi Sultanate, which was then replaced by the Mughal Empire. Uh, the Mughal Empire was sometimes also bloody, but on the whole more peaceful more based on cooperation between Muslim rulers and their Hindu subjects, whereas the, the, the Delhi Sultanate was a very cruel system which went all out in persecuting mm -hmm. the Hindus. Anyway, so he made that estimate. He doesn't say 80 to 100 million people killed. He says missing from demography, okay? So, we already talked about the famines. Several rulers in the Delhi Sultanate were very uh, strict in levying, well, punitive land taxes. And so they also hurt the agricultural system. They also hurt food production. They also caused famines. But that's something else than going out and killing people. So, ever since 1979, these figures are thrown around. I've also quoted them. But they have not been verified or elaborated. And so, this is admittedly very difficult. You see, I mean, e even, you know, as close to us as 1945, in a country as systematic, as bureaucratic, keeping records of everything, like Germany, you see, it's still controversial exactly how many people died. Now, how much the more, when you go back to the Middle Ages, in a country that doesn't write its history very well, like India, so it's an enormous job, you know, any young historians watching this, you have your job cut out for you. There's a lot to do here. You know, make a, a really serious estimate of how many Hindus were killed by Islamic invaders. Now, was this genocide? So this, this word again is thrown around a lot. Genocide means, and I repeat, it means intentionally targeting a community for destruction. This, according to the United Nations definition of genocide, can either mean killing or preventing procreation, all right? 
But what happened in India is not always intentionally, intentionally targeting a community for destruction. So we have already made the uh, distinction with ethnic cleansing. What happened in Kashmir is the expulsion, it's not really the extermination of the Kashmiri Pandits in 1990. In the case of the partition of Pakistan 1947, that's a bit of the tool. You see in some parts of West Punjab, of Sindh, the killers didn't ask questions, didn't look. They killed anyone they could get. All the Sikhs and Hindus were, you know, if they were caught, that was it. On the other hand, their overall plan was simply to purify the land of the pure, because that's what Pakistan means. You know, getting rid of them. Whether they flee or they get killed was not so material. It was not like with the Jewish Holocaust, where the perpetrators really intended to make the Jews disappear from the face of the earth. Here, they just wanted them disappear from Pakistan. So this is a bit of the tool. Kashmir 1990 is definitely not genocide. Uh, why is that? You see, Islam does not target the physical elimination of the unbelievers. There are some encouragements for killing the kafirs, the the, the kafirs, the, the unbelievers in the Quran. But you see, that's again in the context of a war which they want to win. And so after that, the question of killing doesn't arise anymore. The idea is to have them all convert to Islam. And so this is explicitly said in the Quran, war will reign between us until you believe in Allah alone. So unlike the Nazis, for example, the, the, the Muslims, or at least Muhammad, actually wanted world conquest. No limitations, the whole world belongs to us. But it doesn't follow that they wanted to commit genocide. You see, conquest has been there in humanity for many thousands of years. So that's ultimately what they want. And so there is a rule that if you are going to besiege a city, you have to listen, you know, is there a call for azam, for prayer? Is there the azam call for prayer? And so if it is there, it means that Islam can be practiced freely inside that city, then you shouldn't militarily take it. If not, then you first invite them. Dawa in Arabic means invitation. You have to invite them to come over to Islam. And only if then they still refuse, then it is war. So the Hindus in India, you know, if they had no honor, they could always walk over. They could always do what their enemies wanted from them and convert. So you see, the genocidal intention is not really there. Here and there, it took the form of genocide, like in the Armenian genocide, but uh, not in principle. So jihad, the, the holy war, is waged for world conquest, but it prefers mass conversion to mass killing. And if it is mass killing, well, sometimes it is necessary as an instrument of conquest. And so I would impress upon Hindus that nothing is gained by exaggerations. That will always backfire. Now, of course, it will certainly backfire because Hindus are completely on the defensive. It's the, their enemies that control discourse. So the narrative is always against you. And so if they can find fault with what you say, they will do so, and everybody's going to hear it. And so everybody's going to be told, oh, these Hindus are just fake news. So, you see, try to be accurate. And of course... The others are still 
or many of them are still going to try to lie and accuse you of things that you know are not correct but then they are wrong whereas if they accuse you of inaccuracies when you say genocide then they are right so i think it is important to be accurate about this so don't say genocide when that word is not appropriate it it was appropriate in a few cases like what happened in in East Bengal in 1971, that was genocide, but mostly not. And to speak about Hindu Holocaust, as some Hindus do, now that is totally, uh, totally misconceived. Before we come again to, to the discussion of this terminology, which we have to do, nevertheless, I'm going to talk first about one thing that Hindus feel justified in calling genocide, namely the famines. You see here, because of the death toll, you are certainly uh, justified in at least being tempted to use the word genocide. So the Indian famines were usually not attempts to kill Hindus. They were admittedly facilitated by a disdain for the Hindus, which the Islamic rulers in the Sultanate had, for, for Indians, mostly Hindus, but in principle also Muslims, uh, a contempt that the British had, specifically Winston Churchill, who was responsible for the Bengal famine in 1943, killing some three, four million people. Now, what defenders of Churchill would say is that, you know, military circumstances forced his hand. The grain from Australia that could have saved the population in Bengal was needed for the army elsewhere. Or, more strategically, they could also say, well, at that time, the Japanese were still going strong. The British seriously considered the possibility that Japan would overrun Bengal. And so they did not want to provide them with grains. So, you know, if, if the, the Bengalis fell in between the two warring parties, well, so be it. You know, that's more or less how he must have reasoned. Yes, he thought that India was a beastly country with a beastly religion, I quote. So he, he had a very open contempt for the Indians. But nevertheless, that he wanted to kill them, I don't think he had that intention. He was willing to take in stride, yes, millions of them die, but... He did not, like, want them to die. He did not go out of his way, at any rate, to make them die. Okay, so yes, that racism was absolutely there. That could, could be condemned, or that should be condemned. And on the other hand, the mass dying of the Bengalis was also there. But to say that the one caused the other, I mean, we can look into more detail. That's what historians do. But I wouldn't automatically or too easily make that connection. So, I mean, I don't think he had an intention to eliminate them, though effectively he did. So you have the, collective dam the collateral damage as a consequence of punitive tax policies under the Sultanate. You have economic reforms under the British, because the Bengali famine was only the last in a series. So instead of people producing whatever they needed, you see the British made them produce for the international market, so produce textiles that were then processed in England in British factories and then re-exported to India. So that, you know, uh, disorganized the agricultural system. So you have mass deaths that are not genocide like the Great Leap Forward in China, like probably Churchill regarding Bengal. 
So on the one hand, they are responsible. They voluntarily took decisions that they knew would lead to mass famine. That certainly is the case in Bengal because the famine was already there and Churchill still refused to, to send food there. And yet it was not part of a plan of killing. So in judicial terms, you would say it was not murder, it was manslaughter. So how does this compare to the Holocaust? You see, what happened to the Hindus certainly in death toll was larger than the Holocaust. In fact, even if you consider only the 20th century, it already approaches the magnitude of the Holocaust. You see, the, um, the official death toll during partition was uh, 600,000, which is absolutely certainly an underestimate. And in uh, East Bengal, 71, it was about 2.5 million uh, Hindus, plus hundreds of thousands others. So that already in magnitude approaches the Holocaust. So if you consider what happened over a thousand years and in as vast a territory as the whole subcontinent, then easily this dwarfs the Holocaust in magnitude. But you see, in intensity, it comes nowhere near the Holocaust. You see, there was no specific plan of... Uh, do whatever you want, we are going to kill you. No, you know, there were different, different steps in between. You could, of course, convert to Islam. You could accept uh, dimitude, you know, accepting a lower status, paying taxes and so on, accepting a number of privileges for the others, so debilitations, discriminations for yourself. So, you know, on those conditions, mostly you could still live, you know, which is better than the victims of the Holocaust. Also, mostly these killings happened in warfare. So again, you see morally, this doesn't really justify anything, but psychologically, you can understand that people easily take the step of mass killing when there is already killing all around them anyway then in peacetime taking the huge step from peace to mass killing. So it is rarely through state initiative during peacetime. And so a famous case is Aurangzeb, who had inherited this compromise system of the Mughal Empire. And so the Hindus had rebuilt their temples and Hindu life was, you know, subdued but was still going on. And then he got religion. He felt you know, inspired, let's do something about this. Then he gave these orders, you see, destroy all the temples and do what is humanly necessary to make it possible. That is to say, if they resist, well, beat down the resistance. Then apart from killing, of course, there were other uh, elements like mass enslavement. This is also an element of genocide because Enslavement is bad for procreation. So um, then there was mass rape. Of course, this is quite common in conquests and mass cultural destruction. Now, which term should we use for that? You see, I, I, I make a lot of story about not using the word Holocaust, not even using the word genocide. First of all, this is bad diplomacy. You see, some people think the word Holocaust is theirs, and indeed, by custom, now the word Holocaust refers specifically to what happened to the Jews. Uh, it also doesn't draw attention to the specific Hindu experience. You see, why use this word Holocaust that refers to somebody else's experience? You see, if you want to draw the attention of the world to what Hindus have suffered, then use a specific term for what Hindus have suffered. So here, I am not going to dictate to Hindus how they should call their own uh, story, but I know there are words for genocide like Jana Sangharana. So decide among yourself, you see, let the, the, the most literate 
and the most historically competent among you put their heads together and decide on a proper term. Like Hindu Vansha Vichedana. There is the uh, there is a Hindu organization, Hindu Jagaruti Sanghiti or, so, or something. And they use this term, Hindu Vansha Vichedana. So a Vansha means a lineage, a dynasty, and Vichedana means elimination, extirpation. So Hindu Vansha Vichedana, that, for example, is a, is a good term. But at any rate, it should be a specific term. It should describe your experience. Now, finally, we come to our topic. The crime that happened in India is not the same as the Holocaust, but the disinformation techniques to deny it, they are quite similar. But first we have to mention another risk, uh, another difference. There is no risk involved. You see, if you practice negationism regarding the Holocaust, you bring a certain sacrifice. You see that that has social consequences. In India, denying what happened to Hindus also has consequences, but only positive ones. You know, you suddenly are part of the, the so-called secularist class, which is the, uh, those who downplay their Hindu origins, if they have those, or any other party that is against Hindus, like, for instance, uh, Muslim fundamentalists or Christian missionaries or so. In India, they all call themselves secularist. You see, in India, the word secularist has a different meaning from what it used to have in the West. So anyway, that class, you see, looks after itself quite well. Is also looked after, uh, after quite well by the present-day BJP government, you see, which outside propaganda says, you're Hindu fanatical and so on, there's nothing to it. They continue Congress policies in this regard. Uh, their minister, Jadawekar, uh, who was responsible for the school textbooks, said in 2018, after the BJP had been in power for four years, oh, we are proud that in these four years we have not changed one line in the textbooks. And so, till now, it, it hasn't happened. So, um, so, there is no risk involved in practicing history denial, at least if it is this kind of history denial. And we will see why. So, this has been an official policy already started in, on a small scale by the first education minister, Maulana Azad. Maulana Azad was not just anyone. In the 20s, he was a leader of the Khilafat movement. And so he, he gave a fatwa that British India was an infidel state and that Muslims should either leave it so that thousands of families sold everything, fled to Afghanistan, and saw in desperation that they weren't. They weren't waited for, they weren't welcome, and they came back uh, to India. Or, you see, Muslims should flee, or they should wage jihad against this regime. So, you know, this, this was a factor in the Mopla riots, this is a wave of violence in South India that was ostensibly against the British regime. But you see, for a bunch of amateurs to take on a professional army, that's perhaps asking for too much. So they redirected their aggression to their Hindu neighbors. So there's Maulana Azad for you. Now, because when the partition became a talking point, he was on the side of those who opposed partition together with Congress, together with Gandhi and Nehru and so on, he's portrayed as a good guy. Uh, but in fact, what he wanted was to Islamize all of India. 
in the long run. But so he was careful, he was strategic about it. And so he said the, the thing now to do is to keep India together and then gather as much power as we can have in the present setup, which was a lot because Mahatma Gandhi was even willing to make the Muslim League, the party that was in favor of partition, to make that the government for all of India in order to prevent them from pursuing partition, right? So, so Muslim power would, would have been greatly, uh, well, overdone, uh, overrepresented in a united India. Anyway, so he was rewarded for his support to Congress after independence with the job of education minister. Then later when Nehru's daughter Indira Gandhi became the uh, prime minister, then it uh, really took off, mainly through the action of her secretary P.N. Haksar and her education minister Nurul Hassan. This was in fact the result of a sort of power arrangement. She had an inner party power struggle inside the Congress party. So she needed some help from outside. She took help from the left and the arrangement between them was okay. You see all the, the perks of office you can keep for yourself. You know, you can get the jobs and the appearances on TV and everything. But we will have the real power, the cultural power. So from then on, you see, the left takes control over the educational sector. So um, how was this justified to the Indian population? Well, first of all, of course, very many people never asked any questions about it. How often do you talk about the contents of the history school books? But those who did express concern for that, you know, they were given a certain kind of justification. Well, mostly what you have is the same as in Holocaust denial, namely wishful thinking. You see, few people justify to themselves, oh, I'm going to tell lies. You see, very many of the people concerned just have a certain rosy view of Islamic history in India and try to, you know, get that message through in, in the history textbooks. So um, they have this idealized view of Islam, this idealized view of Muhammad, of uh, Akbar, of Mahmoud Ghaznavi and so on. So if there is anything negative to be said, it should be toned down as little as possible. So that, that's, and that's not just true among Indian Muslims, that is true among very, very, very many Hindus also. They don't like bad news. In the case of the Gandhians, of course, there's always this masochism, you know, this idea that uh, if anything bad happens to us, it means we deserved it. And so there you have always the story, oh yeah, caste, yes. There's so much oppression within Hindu society Therefore, it's only normal that such a thing happened to us. Among the hard left, uh, you have also the mythic assumption uh, popularized by M. N. Roy, the first uh, president of the, the Communist Party, that Islam was welcomed in India by the masses, that they felt oppressed and so on, and that finally Islam came to change the system and that, you know, that they would welcome that. Well, that is thoroughly, thoroughly unhistorical. Apart from, of course, being a priori impossible, how would the masses know that this, this enemy at the gates is bringing this or that or this or that system? In, in, you know, in the culture of those days, you know, it's not like they read the website of the enemies or so. <laughs> So this is quite impossible, and anyway, it is not the case. Like you can see, even, even in, in post-war uh, Pakistan, you can see a, the same contempt for the lowest caste that some Hindus also showed. Which is why 
When the Christian missionaries, after independence, still wanted to convert people, the Pakistani government told them, look, you see, this is an Islamic state, these are Muslims, these you can't convert. But if you want to do any conversion, well, we still have these, these chamars and these, you know, these sweepers and, you know, these dirty, low people. And we're not too interested in converting them. You can, okay, that, those people you take. And so that, that contempt for, for the low caste is still very alive among Indian Muslims to the same extent as among Hindus. So as it becomes less and less among Hindus, it admittedly also becomes less among Muslims. So today you won't find too much of it anymore, but it, it's uh, historically, you see that kind of contempt was very much there. So to say that there is some natural alliance between Islam and the low castes is just not true. Then, Many secularists also say and probably believe that if you say the true story about the history of conflict, this will create revenge. Now, I am not aware that anyone has said about Jews or non-Jews speaking about the Holocaust, oh, be careful, you're creating hatred against the German people, you know. I don't think that that has stopped anyone from saying the historical truth about that. And anyway, you see, knowing Hindus a little bit, I have not seen them inclined to this revenge, at least not on account of historical information. You see, when, when for instance, uh, right now, just, just a few days ago, uh, Hindu processions on Ram Navami and on Hanuman Jayanti were attacked by Muslims. Then, yes, you see, some Hindus have rioted back, you know. But, you see, it so happens that uh, probably for most people, but certainly for Hindus, these considerations of what is in their textbooks is not going to determine their behavior. Anyway, so you see, this is also some case to be proven. Where is this revenge? Yeah, let them show that. Then there are also more radical secularists, more radical, well, Islamists, as they say, who just hate Hinduism. And so when they hear, you know, oh, yeah, among Hindus, there is this plan about rewriting the textbooks, they are at any rate against it. So they are attenuated against the correction of history because it's a Hindu project, though it ought to be simply a historian's project. This is not for Hindu Rashtra or, you know, Hindu, any Hindu demand. No, you see, this is what historians should want. Any historian should want the true history to be told. Then um, there are also nowadays the so-called social justice warriors who has something in favor of minorities. They're always against the majority. And in India, the majority happens to be Hindu, at least depending on how you define Hindu. And so the good guys here are the minorities and the Hindus are the bad guys. And so you should not give them any victimhood because now victimhood is a very desirable prize, so we should deny that to them, and therefore we should not tell this history where they were victims. And then there are also the lazy-minded outsiders, you know, the, the, the readers of most of the you know, foreign press of Time magazine that recently wrote a, a really blistering attack on the movie The Kashmir Files, absolutely demonizing the fact that history is finally being told. So you see the readers of the New York Times or of The Guardian or the viewers of CNN or the BBC or so, for them this is all far from their bed. They, you know, for them all religions are equal, equally silly and so 
you know, they don't take this very specific Islamic aggression any more serious than any other religious or non-religious aggression throughout history. So they, they don't see the specifics of this uh, situation and they don't want to, you know, burden their brain with it. All right, some specifics in the disinformation techniques that are being used. Well, the first thing, the main thing to do is to keep the audience in the dark. And this is all the more easy if you have a captive audience that doesn't have any other sources. Now, in the case of history, you see, most people have not learned anything about history except in school. Maybe on occasion they see a historical movie, and then not because it retells history, but because there's some romantic intrigue or something. You know, then they see Joda Akbar or Padmawat or uh, Mohule Azam or so. And um, so if you don't straighten out the school books and perhaps once in a while bring out a, a movie that is true to history, well, you know, then, then they're never going to learn real history. And they won't mind. I mean, what role does history play in most people's lives? You know, it's there. I mean, you know, a guide may explain why there is this statue in, in your square or so, but uh, they don't care. So, you know, it, it makes all the difference whether you write true history or not, because that's the only thing people are going to get. Now, um, if by contrast, some, some historian or history buff calls their bluff and says, wait a minute, you know, this is not true what you're saying, then there are a number of things you can still say to justify yourself. You can say, oh, it was only politics. It had nothing to do with religion. They still say that, you know. 9-11 happened. Yeah, but it had nothing to do with uh, Islam. Okay. Um, then you can say, oh, but it was only the Middle Ages. You see the Middle Ages, they had the Crusades and so on. And, you know, what do you expect? That's what people did. You know, which makes a big, uh, well, which papers over a big distinction between what Muslims did and what Hindus did. Ah, but Hindu kings did just the same. No, they didn't. No, you see, the, the whole secularist view of history amounts to a willful superficiality. And so they paper over differences. They don't want to know. For them, it's all the same. Hindu kings did not act just the same. They did not go conquer Muslim lands and destroy all the mosques there. Sometimes in the fervor of war, you see, victorious Hindu soldiers did destroy mosques. That was never a policy. And a number of rulers decreed specifically against it. Just like, just like you see, so many Hindu women had been raped by Muslim invaders when finally Shivaji started reconquering in the 17th century. He specifically forbade his soldiers of doing now the same to Muslim women. So yes, 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 there is absolutely a difference. Then a, a recent argument I heard from uh, an American historian, Audrey Tushke. Yeah, yeah, it's true that Aurangzeb destroyed a few temples, but he also protected many. Now, first of all, from whom did he protect? temples? Were they threatened by anyone except by himself? And so, you see, you actually also hear that argument, yeah, but Hindus still exist. You know, what, what are you talking about? What is the fuss all about? If Hindus didn't exist anymore, it wouldn't be there. So they exist. So it can't have been that bad. You see, back in the 50s, there was a TV discussion where an American communist, Owen Lattimore, 
was discussing with other guests the uh, concentration camps in, in the Soviet Union and in uh, the People's Republic. And so there was one lady who had survived the uh, Gulag uh, camp. And so she said, you see, this is what happened there, this is what happened there. And he all laughed it off. He said, well, from the fact that you're here, it can't have been that bad because <laughs> you survived. So they didn't kill everyone, did they? Okay. So, yes, you see, you are faced with an enemy that is very self-confident. You know, they think they can handle you. And the way Hindus have behaved so far has been very confused, very unprofessional. The great thing about the film The Kashmir Files is that it draws attention to files. You see, you have to keep archives of what has happened. You know, I mean, all the time I hear Hindus talk about this, so many people have been killed and, and often exaggerated figures. 800,000 million Hindus have been killed. And so if you ask them, where do you get this from? Well, they don't know. They go by rumors. And, you know, that's just not good enough. This matter is way too serious for that. So, yeah, you see, Hindus themselves can also make a great difference in this. So you only help the negationists by not doing your job properly, you see. Develop your own narrative in keeping with the historical facts. Then, a very minor thing, but also, Hindus also connive at censorship. There is a law in India, Penal Code 295A, that prohibits insulting religions. So it is a bit vaguely worded, but you can interpret it as meaning that telling the painful facts about historical conflicts hurts the feelings of some particular community and is therefore forbidden. And indeed, that's how the law was intended. You see, the uh, Hindus had a reform movement from the late 19th century, the Arya Samaj, that was quite forthright in its intention to reconvert Muslims back to their ancestral religions. And so as part of this, it also wrote openly about what Islam had done wrong. And so several writers who did this were murdered, starting with... Uh, in the 1890s with Pandit Lekram and so then several others like famously Swami Shraddhananda, a very important Hindu reformer. And so it is after that particular murder that the British said, okay, we, we, we have to stop this. And in fact, while they were working out what to do, there was yet another very sensational murder of uh, Rajpal. Uh, who had written some rather scurrilous book about the sex life of Mohammed. So uh, that got some uh, commotion going, and so he was murdered. And so the British said, okay, now no joking anymore. And so they prohibited criticism of religion. Now, of course, among the upper circles, both Indian and British, people said, yeah, but you see, in England, there's plenty of religious debate. The Anglicans against the Catholics, against the Puritans and, and the atheists. And so they, they said, yeah, but we are grown-ups. Remember Churchill's mm -hmm. distinction between the grown-up Germans and the childish Italians? Okay, well, you see, we are grown-up. You know, we can handle differences of opinion. But these Indians, they're so emotional. And you see, once you, you know, release that in their circles, then you see bad things are going to happen. Look at these murders. So for this very colonial, racist reason, this censorship law was enacted. And so originally it was meant to protect Islam from criticism because no one else, I mean, Hinduism was being 
being attacked left and right. You see the Christian missionaries, for example, wrote all kinds of things about Hindu superstition, Hindu injustice, and so on. But Hindus didn't react violently. So originally, this was meant to shield Islam. But then later, other religions picked up the idea, yeah, we can use it for us also. So like the Christians uh, managed to get the book, uh, the Da Vinci Code, prohibited. And so Hindus also went to court. You see, they wanted the book, The Hindus, by Wendy Doniger, an uh, Indologist from Chicago, prohibited. They didn't even have to go to court. They just said to the publisher, OK, we're going to court. <laughs> and the publisher said, OK, I'll pulp the book. No more of this book. But this, this was, of course, totally obsolete because Nowadays, you can get this on the internet anyway. And so another publisher also took over, since it was not legally banned, so he took over the publication, so it was also published in paper. So nothing happened. So Hindus only outed themselves as equally prone to censorship as anyone else. That's all they achieved. But it helps the other side in continuing all their slander of Hindus. So um, having a Hindu government ought to make a difference, does it not? Well, no, it doesn't. You see, there's all, all these writings and all these experts, you see, who, who make money. You see, you have a lifelong salary being professors of Indology and so on, experts. You know, they write all the time about, oh, BJP are Hindu fanatics and you see, give them the chance and they will throw all the Muslims into the Indian Ocean. And, you know, so they, have this, they paint this terrible picture of Hindu fundamentalism. Well, you see, the BJP came to power under Tal Bihari Vajpayee and nothing of the sort happened. And then under Modi after 2014, again, nothing of the sort happened. There was nothing pro-Hindu about Vajpayee in power at all. In fact, at the end of his government, one of his uh, colleagues in the BJP uh, Politburo said, you know, to, to, to whip up Hindu feelings for the elections, now we have to come out with something pro-Hindu. And either we do it, then we can proudly say, look, this is what we do for you, or we fail, and then we say, see, we failed because our, we don't have a sufficient majority. Please vote for us. We fight for you. And so the government didn't do that, even for electoral purposes. So whether for Hindu reasons or for purely political reasons, they could not be moved to take a pro-Hindu stand. Except, in one respect, the uh, Minister for Human Resources, Murli Manohar Joshi, announced that the textbooks for history would be rewritten. And indeed, some historians were put to work on writing new history textbooks. It was all quite amateurish. Well, not all. There was one one good one, and it's precisely about the late medieval period, precisely the period when most of these, you know, Islamic attacks happened. That was by Meenakshi Jain. That was totally up to standard. And so you can see the attacks by all the Indologists, by all the India watchers, were mostly directed to her, because precisely she was the one to be taken down, whereas the others, well, there you could say, oh, bad quality or something. You, couldn't, you did not have to say exactly what you were doing it for. You did not have to be ideological. Anyway, you see, the, the whole of the textbooks uh, rewriting was not up to standard. You know, at any rate, for the other side, it was easy to take it down. So in 2004, Congress came to power. These textbooks went out immediately. You see, 
when you now say, why aren't the textbooks being rewritten, then many of the fans of the government will say, oh, but they need time. They need time. Well, Congress needed no time at all. You see, Congress, well, they were in power, but supported by the communists. Maybe that helped. But at any rate, they needed no, they needed no 24 hours to throw out these textbooks. Okay. And so the textbooks that they then brought in, they are still in force. Well, to some extent, it is also state governments that, you know, are competent on this. So state governments in Madhya Pradesh and so on, in, in, in states with a long, uh, long-standing BJP rule, they may have done a little bit more. But on the whole, you see, the BJP has absolutely invested nothing in uh, rewriting these textbooks. Uh, this is not only for the history of conflict, like, for example, uh, Kapil Kapoor and Michel Danino, French naturalized Indian. They had uh, made a textbook about Indian knowledge systems, about all the achievements, Hindu achievements. Hindu, Hinduism is not just yoga. You know, there are many scientific and technological achievements. So the, this was a textbook, you know, detailing this history. And so that was hardly put in, that was written under, co under the Congress government. And that was not made use of much, but at least something, and under the BJP, even less. So it seems that they, don't, they are not concerned with, you know, any Hindu concerns, but they don't have to be. You see, history should be correctly written just for the sake of history. And um, so these unpleasant parts of history really have to be told. Yeah. Another case here that seems to have little to do with India, but um, it concerns Hindus, namely those settled in California. You see, in California, in other American states too, they uh, review the textbooks every 10 years. And so if there is something there that particularly concerns some community that still exists today, then that community is invited to, you know, give their opinion. That's not a last word, of course, that the historians keep to themselves, but at least they want to take that into account. So the social science textbooks came up for review in California in 2006. And the Hindus had prepared some edits to what they found to be present in the textbooks. And uh, some of them were quite obvious. Like, for instance, there was a photograph of a mosque with the caption, Hindu temple. So that was simply a mistake that was totally uncontroversial. Then there were other things, like, for instance, Hindus were, or Hinduism was defined as pursuing self-realization. I think that's unobjectionable, though I'd say most Hindus aren't <laughs> really working on that. That's for a certain, you know, spiritual elite. But okay, it's, it's there, you know, the, the term, you know, ought to be mentioned. Now, some devotional Hindu said, no, no, this should not be self-realization. This should be God-realization. Well, maybe. At any rate, you see, there were edits uh, proposed that were, you know, some of them were reasonable, some of them were obvious, some of them were arguable. But one was completely out of bounds. This was, they denied that there had been an Aryan invasion. Most of the history books about India start with the Aryan invasion. And so that is right now being discussed a lot. So there is an alternative, which most Hindus like, which is the out of India theory. So that is being discussed, that it's, the jury is still out on that. And yet, you see all those Hindus who clearly were a bit uninformed, or rather, were mostly staying in their own bubble, 
in their own echo chamber where they told each other, oh yeah, Aryan invasion, a ridiculous uh, racist, colonialist, uh, and they never heard any other voice. And so they insufficiently realized that this Aryan invasion theory is at most controversial, but has certainly not been thrown out. And yet, you see, they were claiming, oh, the Aryan invasion theory is, you know, has been refuted, is totally outdated and so on. Now, that was very sure to provoke reaction from scholars, from uh, Western scholars specialized in the Aryan invasion theory, who then struck down this, you know, who influenced the, the Board of Education in California. No, this, you shouldn't listen to them here. You see, this is pure propaganda. This does not reflect the state of scholarship. And as a consequence, many of the other edits were also struck down. So, you see, by being a bit careless, a bit uh, overambitious, Hindus smashed their own windows badly. And so they didn't like the decision of the Board of Education. They appealed to that, lost again, then went to court to overrule this decision, lost, then appeal, they lost again. The most complete defeat you can get. So you can see here that good intentions are not good enough. You see, Hindus had a case had a very good case, they didn't handle it according to the rules, and they smashed their own windows. They had better results in uh, 2016 when this review you know, was done again. So they learned, this is not to put Hindus down forever, but you see in this case they simply, <laughs> simply weren't successful, and fortunately they learned from their defeat. But at any rate, this is, this is uh, a very prominent case that is very often referred to when they say, oh yeah, you can't trust these Hindus. You see, they do false history, they do fake news on a millennia large scale. So please uh, be careful. So what to do? Well, there is no substitute for collecting all the data and weighing them carefully, you see, applying the historical method to them and only come out with a, a summarized version, that the one that, is, that fits in, in textbooks, after you've gone through this, this exacting, this demanding scholarly process. So that's the lesson from the movie, The Kashmir Files. You should keep files. See, in the movie, these files are not even very ambitious. Simply the fact that somebody keeps newspaper clippings from the local press that does report on riots and killings and so on that the national press in India doesn't report on. Okay, so simply keeping this much of report on the data already makes the difference you see, really convinces someone that the, the syrupy, rosy history that is being told, you know, needs an amendment. There is no substitute for government action. You see, private initiatives like the movie The Kashmir Files, they're nice. They may sometimes create an atmosphere temporarily, but we're not satisfied with that, you know. This should go into the official history, this should be on the government website, this should be in the textbooks. And uh, if the government is not willing to do that, well, then we have a problem. Because you cannot take the place of the government and install it in government textbooks. So, there you see no substitute for government action you will have to convince them. However, nowadays, thanks to modern technology, a, a lot of difference can still be made privately. Namely, you can make sure that online, at least the true version is available. 
So again, you have to do the historical work. You do not have to settle for all these rumors that are doing the rounds, you see, everywhere on the internet, but especially in India. And uh, so do the, do the job properly and then make it available. Now, here, here I have to report a lot of progress. You see all these online media. There are many of them, and some of them are also good. You know, here I can apply the Hegelian reasoning that quantity generates quality. And so, you see, these online media are competing against one another and getting better and better and better. And you have the, uh, the Jaipur dialogues. And uh, so you have papers like, uh, like Opindia, like Pragyata. I mean, I, I shouldn't try to enumerate them because then inevitably I'll still forget a few and do injustice to them. But so there are already a few dozen. And so they are really now stimulating this search. They are piecemeal, but more and more highlighting specific episodes, doing the detailed, the detailed research on those episodes. And so gradually uh, a far better, a far more correct picture of Indian history is emerging. Now, those who um, still try to defend history denial by saying, oh, but true history is going to provoke revenge, let's state very clearly that, uh, and this is a matter of politics, not of history, which is my field, but for what I understand of the Hindu nationalists who are concerned with this a correcting of history, what they pursue is what has been called in South Africa truth and reconciliation. You see, it is perfectly possible for people to accept that they have been in the wrong or their ancestors have been in the wrong, uh, which again makes it more palatable to, <laughs> to admit this. You see, I mean, you know, I don't think it's difficult to accept the fact that humanity has made progress, also moral progress, and that therefore, at some point in the past, our ancestors were more primitive, were less sensible and sensitive, were less morally aware than we are expected to be today. So therefore, Yes, these unpleasant things have happened in history, and there is no reason at all not to face them. Thank you.